Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, Sheboygan County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Mike Vandersteen. And as you know, every month we try to cover one of our 22 departments, and today we're very pleased to have with us our District Attorney, Joe DiCecco. Joe, well, thank, you, thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us. Joe is a tremendously busy department head. In fact, we don't have him on here every year. It's been, I think, since 2006 since we've had the pleasure of him joining us. Uh, you certainly follow him perhaps in the in the press and the very important work he does. And today, Joel's going to talk a little bit about the roles and responsibilities of the district attorney's office. So, Joe, please start with sharing with our viewers a little bit about yourself and, and when you became the, the district attorney. Well, I'm, a, I'm from New England, as many people can tell from my accent. I went to UW-Madison Law School, mm -hmm. and once I was about to graduate there, I found out about the reciprocal agreement where if you stayed in the state of Wisconsin to practice law, you wouldn't have to take a bar exam. And I thought, well, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> and so, and I always wanted to be a prosecutor. I, I didn't want to do any other type of law. And I was fortunate to find a job in Sheboygan County and began here as an assistant district attorney on September 5th of 1989. I've been here ever since. In 2002, I ran and was elected as district attorney, and I've been district attorney up to, that, up to this time. And so you started in the district attorney's office 1989. 1989. Uh, what made you decide to run? And just so our viewers are clear, you know, this is an elected position, right. uh, how often... Uh, do you need to run? How long is the term? A little bit of background. Well, the term for a long time has been two years, and this is the first four-year term. I believe all, almost all the state constitutional officers, which I'm one of, right. now have four-year terms, uh, which makes it better because um, you no longer, you know sooner when the election begin your term, and it's time to think about running, running for re-election, whether or not you have an opponent. Um, right. And so I think the four-year term was a good idea, and I, I believe it also is translated to the sheriff's a four-year term. These, I believe the county clerk, the county treasurer, they're all four-year terms now. They were two-year terms, so that's good. I just decided uh, that uh, things needed to be changed in the office, and I ran, and, and um, the, uh, the uh, DA at the time, Bob Wells, decided he, he wanted to do something else, and mm -hmm. so uh, I was elected DA in 2002 and began serving in 2003. Very good. And how would you describe your uh, roles and responsibilities? Well, our office is responsible for prosecuting all crimes that occur in the county of Sheboygan. And we also have other responsibilities. For example, we, uh, there are statutes that require us, require us to prosecute um, non-criminal violations, traffic tickets and things of that nature, mm -hmm. for the, for the uh, Sheboygan uh, County Sheriff's Department, for the Wisconsin State Patrol, and for the Department of Natural Resources. So we do a lot of the, um, the typical things that municipal court might do for municipal agencies. We do that for the Sheriff's Department, for the State Patrol, and for uh, the DNR. We're also required uh, to perform a, a number of actions in juvenile court. Um, uh, juveniles who are uh, alleged to have committed a crime, obviously we don't call it a crime, we call it a delinquent act, mm -hmm but have violated a criminal statute, they're called delinquents, we prosecute them. We do children in need of protection of services, children have been abused. Um, we do juveniles in need of protection of services, mostly truancies. Uh, we do termination of parental rights when a uh, situation gets to the point where uh, the human services is looking for a, a, a person's rights as a parent to be terminated so the child can be adopted by uh, a family. We do those too as well. So we do we have quite a quite uh, a serving on our plate of the requirements that we have to do. And with, with uh, the vast responsibilities that you have, how many employees do you have? How do you get this all done? Well, we have eight prosecutors, including myself, seven to full-time, one is half-time. We have 15 county employees, uh, two of whom are the check fraud people, which I think we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, and uh, the rest of them are <laughs> professional support staff, paralegals, legal secretaries, uh, persons who assist us in all the paperwork, uh, generated by by our duties and again one of 22 departments in Sheboygan County though you're an elected department head elected official you have both uh, you have 15 as you said county employees that's in the correct. office but you have a budget that's comprised of county property tax levy and state funding that's correct uh, all the prosecutors salaries and benefits are paid for by the state uh, but everything else uh, including the uh, county employees uh, salaries and benefits and the infrastructure, the actual building, the place where we have in the courthouse, the day-to-day -day operating costs are all part of a county budget. And so I'm fond of saying that, you know, when times get tough, we not only get um, 
restrictions from the county, but we also get it from the state as well. So it's right. kind of a double-edged sword that we have to really look at both of them um, and, and make some type of compromise to efficiently do our work. Right. And as you and I, and certainly Chairman Vandersteen knows, when time gets tough, generally uh, your workload increases because more crime is going on in the community. And that's true to some degree. Um, but what really is going on in the community now, and I, I think this last trial we had, the homicide trial, highlighted some of that, is the influx of drug dealers in Tishpoin County. Um, and not only the drugs they bring in here, which wouldn't be possible if people didn't buy them and, and help them out here, but also, as in that last case, the type of violence they bring up here as well. Mm -hmm. So that, that is probably our main concern now, is this influx from other areas of uh, some people that are potentially very violent. So as you describe the relationship of your office with the county and with the state, how, where does the state attorney general fit in? The state attorney general does a number of things for us. They don't directly supervise us, but they do have some statutory requirements. One is, is that any appeal concerning constitutional law must be okayed by them. So if we go into court and we had a, a, a statement of a defendant suppressed uh, for Miranda violation, I think most people know what Miranda is, uh, and we want to appeal that to a higher court, the Court of Appeals, we can't do that on our own. We have to apply to the Attorney General's office uh, so that there's a statewide level of uh, cases, that is, so that the, the, the Attorney General can keep an eye on these type of cases on a statewide level and pursue those cases which they, which they think are important and not pursue those which they don't, which they think are not either winnable or, or they, they don't think, believe it should be appealed. Uh, and also the Attorney General gives opinions. He'll give opinions which are binding on us as far as what a law may, may mean. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, a little while ago he gave an opinion on what the <coughs> Second Amendment, Amendment to the Wisconsin Constitution meant as far as the right to bear arms. His opinion was concerning the practice in other counties, not in this county, of people being charged with disorderly conduct for openly carrying a firearm. His opinion was that that is absent any other problem that's not appropriate, it violates the Wisconsin Constitution. Uh, district attorneys would be obligated to follow that opinion uh, given by uh, whatever attorney general happens to be, in this case, is J.B. Van Hollen. Right. So we have that type of relationship. Also, they're a great resource for us. Uh, we don't ask uh, for them to prosecute our cases. That's, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. In some counties, particularly up north, where there's only, only the district attorney, that's all there is, and they may get a homicide case. In fact, there was a shooting uh, a few years ago. The Attorney General's Office Criminal Division prosecuted that. They, they assist in those type of things. And they assist, uh, they, they also do all the uh, sexual offender laws. That is, the people who are being committed under Chapter 980 as uh, persons who have committed a sexual offense, their term is up. They're not on the supervision anymore, whatever they had. And now the state is seeking to keep them civilly committed because of the dangerousness to either children or to other people. And they do that as well. So they, they help us out in some things. We don't have a direct supervisory relationship with them um, except in the appellate process. And they're a great resource for us as well. So to summarize, you're elected by the people, a four-year constitutional office. Uh, you have 15 county employees and five... Eight prosecutors. Eight prosecutors. Including myself. County funded, state funded. Right. You have a state legislature and a governor that's responsible for, for pr providing state funds. You have a district attorney or a state attorney general right. that has some oversight responsibilities, some constitutional responsibilities. And then you report to a Sheboygan County Board Law Committee or a Liaison Committee. Correct. And that's the final piece here. What is your relationship then with the county board and the law committee? How does that work? Well, you know, I know quite a few of the county board members, and, but my direct relationship is with the law committee. That's our liaison committee between the county board and our office. And over the years, um, I've always had a good relationship with them. I, I, I think they understand uh, what we do. They understand the problems we have. They're very supportive in assisting us in uh, finding answers to things. Uh, the check diversion program originated in the law committee. Uh, we brought that to the law committee and discussed that. And we were encouraged by them to, to go forward with that, um, uh, which eventually became a county ordinance, which is bringing in revenue to the, uh, into, the, uh, into the county as well as returning a lot of money to right. uh, merchants uh, who had been the victim of bounced checks. Um, so I have a good relationship, I think, with um, certainly with the law committee. And then I have individual relationship because I know people on the county board. I don't, I'm not really directly, um, well, except for finance, I suppose, to some degree, but mm -hmm. uh, the finance committee. But I don't really have that type of relationship with anyone else on the county board 
uh, that I have with the uh, law committee, which is our liaison committee, which is, in my opinion, a very good relationship. And that's a, that's a role that every department has where they have a specific liaison committee that they mm -hmm. report to. We have nine. The law committee is not Joe's boss. Uh, Joe answers to the people as a constitutional officer, but the law committee has a lot of say on how the budget's developed sure. and how much resources that uh, the district attorney's office may receive ultimately approved by the full county board. Nice overview. I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Adam. Um, as was mentioned before, Joe, you know, the caseload that you're carrying uh, is going up. Could you give us a little idea of the number of cases you're taking care of and some of the trends you're seeing in, in the type of individuals oh, that are sure. coming through the system? Absolutely. Um, last year, uh, we prosecuted about 6,400 cases. Uh, roughly half of those, 3,200, were actual criminal cases. The rest were uh, juvenile cases and the non-criminal uh, things that we talked about, about my duties with the, the Sheriff's Department and uh, other agencies uh, in, um, in Sheboygan County. There are actually eight law enforcement agencies in Sheboygan County, uh, including the DNR and the Wisconsin State Patrol. Um, we've seen uh, an almost steady increase in the number of cases over the last several years. Last year, there's a slight decline, but it was really insignificant. Um, we've seen an increase in the amount of resources we have to put into drug investigations. And that culminated last year with a roughly 18-month investigation, 18-month long investigation, uh, in which we used resources of the federal government, of the state uh, division of criminal investigation, and our own people here um, in um, crippling, in my opinion, crippling a, a massive uh, cocaine delivery ring that was uh, out of Chicago uh, into Sheboygan and other parts uh, to Appleton and to Green Bay. We've seen an increase in um, those type of cases. It's prompted by the fact that, and we're seeing people who don't live here come into the community uh, to um, distribute this stuff. And it's mostly cocaine or crack cocaine. And what we're seeing is um, that we have to get more and more sophisticated and use resources that we can't supply on our own. For example, in this last case, we had two wiretaps in place. We've never done that before in Sheboygan County, at least to my knowledge. And because the wiretap statute is based on the federal statute, of the Wisconsin wiretap statute, you have reams and reams of paperwork to do to legally get a wiretap order. The amount of simple, the amount of um, documents needed to get these two wiretaps is about four inches thick. And that's, that's because the federal requirements, because the states adopted that. In addition, we needed the expertise to run these 24 hours a day. Wiretap is where someone's actually listening into a conversation. Um, they call wiretaps, although we don't tap them anymore. It's all electronic now, so it's really just getting a, a uh, computer or a number of computers with a feed in from the, from the um, from the phone companies because it's all digitized now. It's not actually clipping those two little alligator clips into a line and listening there. Uh, and there are, very, there are restrictions with that. Uh, we needed help with that. We needed 24 hours a day. So we had help from not only the agencies here in Sheboygan County, but from the state and from the feds as well. And financial support, fortunately, for the feds. The wiretaps cost us about $10,000. That money was fronted by the, by the federal government, by, the, uh, by DEA. So we're very grateful for that. We're trying to help recover some of that for them. but we never would have had those kind of resources. And uh, that's the kind of investigation we're seeing now. We're not just stopping at the county border. We're, we're going beyond the county border to see how far back it goes. Uh, and it's ending up in Chicago, ultimately. It goes down to Milwaukee. And that's a kind of uh, thing that could not, it could not exist up here without, unfortunately, Sheboygan County residents participating in it, purchasing it, and actually helping to distribute it. So that's what we see a growth in. Uh, we had, uh, in addition to the, the 100 or so uh, search warrants that were issued last year, about, about 94 of them were drug-related. We also issued 24 additional warrants that had, were, were specifically drug-related. These were sophisticated electronic warrants, and I won't go into detail, uh, but technology is changing. We have to keep up with the change. And then, of course, we had the two wiretaps, uh, too, which was just an incredible amount of work. And, and so what we're trying to do is to... to provide the people of Sheboygan County with, one, the knowledge of what's going on here, and two, in using every available resource we can to try to break up these drug rings, and, and you know as well as I do, 
As soon as we break up one, there's another one to take its place. It's an ongoing thing. And we're not talking about marijuana, we're talking about cocaine uh, and crack cocaine, which is extremely addictive. And so that's the trend I see right now, and it's, 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 a, it's a frustrating and concerning trend to see this type of drug activity, uh, not only to, uh, on occasion, uh, to end here in Sheboygan, but to come into Sheboygan where it uses the transit route to go out to other communities in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I-43, we <coughs> routinely refer to it as the drug highway because of all the drugs moving through this area um, on the interstate. So that's, that's a big concern for us. I agree it's a disturbing trend and I'm glad that you're adjusting your offices to, uh, to, to meet that demand and, and take care of those crimes that are occurring. Um, Recently, in the last about two years, we've seen a municipal court uh, uh, grow in uh, Sheboygan and, and Kohler. How has that affected the number of cases or the type of cases that you're seeing? Well, uh, it, it really uh, only affects um, the, well, it does affect us. It does help us out. Uh, about um, 400 cases last year, and at least the, in the city of Sheboygan and the Kohler, uh, I believe they're together in the municipal court, of first offense drunk drivings. There are about 400 cases. <clears throat> and were it not for the municipal courts, we'd have to prosecute those. So that's 400 cases that we didn't have to do uh, because the municipal courts were doing it. And that's not even including some of the other municipal courts in, in the county, just uh, Sheboygan and Kohler. So it does help us out. It, it takes, uh, it, 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 it not only helps the municip municipalities out because they get to keep a portion of the court costs uh, for their own programs. Um, but it helps us out because it lessens our workload. Um, when, when the legislature was talking about making uh, drunk driving a first offense a criminal offense, uh, the first thing I looked at were the numbers from municipal courts trying to figure out, okay, how would that affect us? And just in the Sheboygan Municipal Court alone, that's 400 more cases. That would be a 30% increase in our traffic crimes. That would be a devastating effect if it weren't for the fact that municipalities are handling these. So they're a great boon to us. They apparently, you know, they, they help with uh, generating funds for the municipalities that, that, that they uh, work out of. So it's all around, I think it's a pretty good deal. That's good to hear that it's a positive development yeah. for, for you in, in assisting you. Uh, as you know, uh, Sheboygan seems to get a fair amount of uh, uh, maybe bashing a little bit. And some <laughs> people have, uh, have, have, have cited that uh, you know, some of the press releases or e emails that you send out to the local media mm -hmm. bring some of this on. Av obviously, you're reporting the facts, but could you explain a little bit about the process you go through in publicizing the court cases you have and, and why you're doing that? Sure. Uh, the process is this. Every uh, people are arrested on a continual basis and uh, they're placed in jail and they usually have their first appearance in front of a judge in most cases the court commissioner who works for the judges the very next day sometimes it's two days but the very next day in order for them to do that initial appearance we have to have a criminal complaint ready we have to file a criminal complaint which is a written document states them the charge that kind of stuff um, every day once those are filed uh, with the clerk of courts and they become a public record i email them out to the local media that includes the press it includes HBL, it includes the Plymouth Review, it includes the Sounder. Uh, that's really the core group. And the reason I do that is twofold. One is if I don't, they call me every day and ask me what's going on, what's new, can you give us a copy of the thing? Secondly, and the, most, the more important to me is, I think people in this county deserve to know what's going on in this county as far as crime is concerned. And we used to have, and I'm not, this is not a criticism, but the press used to have uh, and HBL too, used to have people assigned just to the courts. And they would report on all this stuff in the courts. They would, that, that was their beat, the courts. We don't have that anymore. And so um, uh, without that type of coverage, uh, when I became DA, I thought it would, one, help me by not getting these calls every single day about who's locked up and what they charge with. Uh, and it would help uh, people in the county realize that I think they have the right to know what's going on and what kind of crimes are being committed, who, you know, what, what the number of crimes that are being committed. And, yeah, occasionally uh, an outside uh, Sheboygan news agency will get a hold of that and ask for a copy. It's a public record. I send it to them. Uh, occasionally I'll make comments on camera if I think it's appropriate. Um, but I think it's an educational process. I think one of the things we emphasized during this last trial, the homicide trial, to that jury and to the public in general was that you're gonna see some things here that you don't know exist in this county, that you have no idea what's going on. And because you live in this county, 
I think you should know about this. You should know about how drug dealing is done uh, here. You should know about where it's coming from. Uh, you should know about crimes. You should know about people that sexually assault children, uh, not just from the sexual registry, but when, when they're brought in, uh, when the process begins. Um, it's an informational type of thing with me. I think a, a forewarned public uh, is a forearmed prop, uh, public that they, uh, knowing that these types of things are possible, uh, perhaps it'll aid them in some way in prevention. I still think Sheboygan County is one of the best places to live. Uh, we really don't have the type of crime problems that uh, uh, cities of our size are beginning to have. We certainly don't have the crime problems that larger cities I have. We're not as Milwaukee is the homicide capital of the state of Wisconsin. But I think that's because uh, people need to know what's going on, what kind of crimes are being charged in, in this county, and uh, who's, who's doing them. Well, and that's, that's just my opinion. I appreciate it, and thanks for that explanation so we understand how your office functions in that area. You've been uh, uh, squeezed a lot on by the state now, and, and they're, they're, they're trying to uh, give you even more budget constraints to deal with. Um, could you give us a little idea how this is affecting your office and what you're planning on for the, the near future, at least? Well, we have an immediate crisis, uh, and we have a long-term crisis. The long-term crisis is, is that the state has consistently underfunded prosecutors' offices around the state. In 1990, the state became responsible for the salaries and benefits of prosecutors. Prior to that, it was county by county. And the reason the state did that was to provide a level of salary and benefits that would be the same across the state and to give persons who wanted to do a prosecutor's job an opportunity to perform in a career and to not just use it as a stepping off point to get a better job with a private attorney, uh, a private defense attorney thing. And that meant regular raises and meant incentives and things of that nature. Almost from the get-go, the state did not comply with that. Uh, we're now at the point where the state's own independent bipartisan agency, Legislative Audit Bureau, <coughs> developed a system of comparing the number of prosecutors to their caseloads uh, for a decade now, it's been, uh, since, since we did the beginning. And what they have shown is, is that statewide we're about 117 prosecutors shy, and in Sheboygan County we have five full-time prosecutors short of what we're supposed to have. The critical thing is that the state is now trying to institute the permanent layoff of prosecutors. If we were to lose one prosecutor, I mean, we're already five down, we lose one, we're going to be in a situation where we have mm. to not prosecute some relatively minor misdemeanors. And as I indicated previously publicly, that's about 1,200 misdemeanors that we have to stop prosecuting if we lose a prosecutor. We have five courts that all do criminal stuff here. I have to assign one prosecutor to each court on a 100% basis. That leaves uh, one person, uh, the deputy DA does all the juvenile stuff. We have the, that leaves a half-time person to take care of the odds and ends and me to do the more complicated or more lengthy cases. That's it. And uh, so, yeah, I, I hope that they won't, don't come to that permanent layoff. It's not like, you know, everyone has to share this equally across the state. There are some jobs that you don't want to cut, and I think prosecutors are one of them. I think people sometimes don't understand that it's all right for police, you know, it's all well and good the police do an investigation and arrest someone. If we don't issue the charge and prosecute in the court, that's the end of it. It's done. You know, it doesn't matter what the police do. Uh, and so we're an integral part of the police process. We're an integral part of the criminal justice system uh, in the prosecuting of people. And I wish some state legislators would, would, would learn that. And apparently, well, we're getting some publicity now, so apparently that awareness is, is, is heightening. Well, thanks for letting us know about those challenges you're facing. With that, I'll turn it back over to Adam. It's like a broken record. Mm -hmm. Anything with the state, whether it was promised or implemented 8, 10, 20 years ago, it just seems like it's not being car carried oh, through. And, and I'll tell you, Adam, it's worse than that. It's, it's got to the point where, um, not to the point where, this has been going on for a while. For example, there was uh, in the last, not the, this budget, but the previous budget, there was a utility fee increase on utility bills, a tax, mm -hmm. that was supposed to go to prosecutors' things. And then, that was great. That passed. And then what happens? They switch it. Right. It goes to the general fund. Right. And they use it for anything they want. Right. You know, so they say, well, I voted in favor of prosecutors, or I voted in favor of this, and they switch around. I don't know how many people know that. When we were first created in, in, uh, as state employees in 1990, our funding came from the state lottery. From the state lottery. Huh. And all of a sudden, it was gone. It was like it wasn't the state lottery anymore. It right. was, it, that went somewhere else. 
Right. So it's this bait and switch thing, this, yeah. this shell game that goes on all the time, where in the, in the beginning it looks like, oh, that's great, they're doing a great thing, and then when something else, they want to divert it somewhere else, they do it. Yeah. And that's, that's, you're right, that's the problem. And it's been around for a while. It's been around for decades. Yeah. We have the same issue in our clerk of courts, which is obviously a support mm -hmm. department in the, in the judicial system. And the funding will be raised, revenue will be raised, fees will be increased, but the state takes it for their own purposes and doesn't keep it in our court system. And then property taxes go up. We only have a couple more minutes, mm -hmm. but, but this is obviously a, a critical, critical area of concern, as you said, not only today, but in the future. Mm -hmm. This has got to get fixed. In the meantime, you have a state legislature that wants to you know, keep people in jail longer and, and get tougher on crime, and all that sounds good when you're on the soapbox. And we certainly want to have effective law enforcement, but if we don't have effective prosecution, if we don't have the prosecutors in place, the job doesn't get done. These folks are put back out in the street or we just can't effectively complete the cycle. That's true, and, and unfortunately, you know where the blame's gonna land on that? It's going to land on the individual DAs for not doing sure. their job. Sure. And it's kind of frustrating because we do the, you know, we're all working 50 to 60 hours a week, all the prosecutors. We're trying, and we don't get paid overtime. Yeah. You know, we're all trying to do the job, and there's right. just too many cases to do it. And the legislature keeps, in the last three sessions alone, they've either created or increased the penalties on 60 crimes. Not one nickel to go to prosecutors' uh, salaries to, to help ease. Uh, to help ease the caseload by providing more, more prosecutors. The only exception was the drunk driving bill that recently passed in which the Joint Finance Committee did uh, grant $700,000 to go to prosecutors to offset, not to have more prosecutors, but to offset a deficit um, that the DOA created itself by, by messing around with the budget. So you're right. I mean, I, I don't know where it's going to end. Um, it can't go on like this. It just can't. Yet it continues to go on, and as you can see, the passion can start coming out right away when you start talking about roles and responsibilities of whether it's prosecution or anything at county government level where there's a reliance on state government. For decades, the state has not been meeting its obligations, and it's coming home, and I can't say enough about the fine work that Joe DiCecco has done as their district attorney. He works so hard. He's highly dedicated extremely conscientious and I'm glad that he's been willing to beat the drum a little bit and try to raise awareness to this problem. Unfortunately, it seems as though it, it is a broken record or Groundhog Day because it just continues and continues and sadly, I hope it doesn't take a crisis to get it fixed, but I'm starting to think that might be the case. Joe, thanks for your time today and, and joining us and shedding a little light on the important work that you do. Well, thank you and the chairman for having me. I appreciate it and I enjoyed it very much. And until next time, thank you for joining us. Don't ever hesitate to contact any of us at the county level if you have suggestions or concerns or want um, more questions answered on what you may have heard today. Next month, we're going to have someone from the UW Extension Office, which is housed right here at UW Sheboygan. It'll either be Dave Such, our director, or one of his staff. So until then, thanks for joining us.